Uh, this is a tutorial about topological filters uh, via sheaves. Um, the kind of topological spaces that we're going to consider are uh, simplicial complexes. And these are spaces that are purely combinatorially defined and they're very nice to use computationally. Uh, a zero simplex you can think of just as a, a topological point. Um, uh, a one simplex is uh, two zero simplices, two points that are somehow connected with a path. And uh, a two simplex would be three points that define a topological area-like thing that is bounded by topological paths. Um, and a simplicial complex is uh, the connection of these things along shared simplices. And given that we don't particularly care about the, the simplicial complex, but the construction on top of it, we're actually gonna use the simplest possible case. This here we're gonna call a line complex. So this is just the alternation of uh, zero simplices and one simplices that form something that looks like the real line. And uh, we will just add the labels of these entities uh, to help us show what's going on here. Now, uh, we have maps that allow us to navigate this topological space, right? So for example, we can decide we have a map going from a lower dimensional simplex to a connected higher dimensional simplex. And this map tends to be called the co-boundary operator. Uh, but there's also other maps that you could consider. We could go the other direction. We could flip all the arrows and then we get the boundary operator. So we could go from the one simplex to the zero simplex. Uh, we're just going to consider the co-boundary operator in these constructions, and it doesn't really matter. You just flip errors if you want a different kind of construction here. Now, the point of sheaves is that we want to somehow formalize this notion of attaching data to a topological space. Uh, and so here we have some type of a data that I don't specify for now that we uh, that lives over uh, zero simplex. Um, and the rules of a sheaf is that we actually do this for all the simplices in our simplicial complex. So over every single simplex, here's the one simplex, we attach some other data and so forth. So we do this over all the simplices in our uh, simplicial complex. So that's the first criterion for a sheaf. The second criterion is that whenever there is a map downstairs, so we have a relationship on our um, simplicial topology, we require to construct a map upstairs, uh, a sheaf map that relates the data over these um, uh, simplices um, uh, appropriately. So that's the second criterion. So we relate uh, data, we relate maps. And the final criterion is that what we're doing here has to make sense. And by sense, there's two ways to think about that. One is in terms of that, Right, so you see there's two arrows actually pointing on the same data here, right? And from the perspective of the data, this data has to be some sort of consistent or unique, but this can't be, this, this arrow can point to a different type of data than this, uh, this arrow, then we wouldn't be able to speak of a unique, unique object here, right? The second way to think about that is in terms of uh, map composition. So these two maps actually has to have to be composed to be, we have to be able to create a composite map to get here. And if something messy is going on here, we might not be able to compose. And these are two ways to basically specify the same notion that we need here to make this work out. And these three conditions are actually the definition that we're gonna work with uh, for a sheaf. So we have attaching data, attaching maps, and um, consistency slash uh, compositionality. Okay, so with that, let's actually do something slightly more interesting. We we'll go back to just considering data and we're gonna attach something that has a little bit more structure. So this object here, we're gonna call a topological filter. And you see, we actually have split up our data in a way into three um, types, three instances here and they actually are connected by maps. So the, the reason why this is a topological filter, we have some notion of an input data here. We have some notion of a state and we have some notion of uh, an output and these maps actually provide a notion of local computation 
that allows us to do something here. So a filter usually takes some input with some extra information, computes an output. So this is a very general definition of what filters tend to do. But what's exciting for uh, thinking about sheaves over topological space, what we're doing here is we're actually attaching local computation over a single simplex, right? So it's not just that this is a coloring of a graph or a weight to an edge. We actually can have complicated entities that do internal computation associated to a, uh, to a piece of topology. And so that, that is part of why this is actually much richer than say color graph theory or, um, or you know, uh, edge flow and stuff like this. So now this is just now the data. So we need to actually repeat the construction that we've done for uh, the, 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 the sheet before in that we need to uh, have data over all our uh, simplices and we need to provide chief maps between the data. And now we have a full sheet construction for a topological filter. And I've just labeled some of these maps, but in principle, you need to consider all of them, obviously. Uh, but this is still very abstract. We have not at all said what we mean by this uh, sheaf data here. We have not specified any of these maps. And uh, this is actually general. You can do a lot of crazy different things with this. But just to illustrate how this works, I'm going to give one uh, example. And that's actually taking classical linear time invariant filter theory as the test case of how we can put that into this sheaf structure. So I, I don't assume that you guys know uh, classical time invariant filter theory, but this is basically the one slide explanation of this. What, what happens here is we have one input, we have one output, and we have a state slash shift register. So what happens at each sort of new sample, we're going to shift down here by one, and we're going to load in information. What's here gets pushed down. So this is just a shift register, and it's a vector that contains our current state. We have a simple linear map here. We just, just a summation down of the state with weights to one. So this is clearly a linear map. And we have a linear map here, which is the summation of the state for an output. So for an output computation. And this is a feedback because you can see that this goes back into this uh, state here. So from this, we can now actually specify what the content is of our sheaf structure. And so, uh, up here, we're just going to consider a single audio sample, if you think of digital audio, for example, or single data entry in a vector space as an input. And we're going to do the same for, the, for an output. We just have a simple uh, single data point as an output over one location on our, up on our topological space. And we have this um, state sheaf here now that actually has specific dimension. This number n is the length of that shift register we had in the picture. And there is a plus one here. And the reason why I have this plus one here is because we actually have an input here to consider. So for these maps to be able to be linear, we need to make space for some extra information that we then compute on, right? So this, the total state here is the input injected plus the internal state of this filter. We, have a further thing going on here that we actually decided, look, over these one simplices, the just connections, we're not providing any input, right? We just have uh, audio engineers would say at sample points, we have some audio. And in between, we have nothing. There's another interpretation of this that just says, these samples are independent. There's no computation between them. There's nothing going on. Um, and so, What's happening here for that reason is because there's no input here, we don't need to make space to inject an input. So we just have this length of that state vector here raw. There's no nothing else going on. And so now that all these spots are specified, we have all the maps specified that, we, that are non-trivial, right? We have an input map with an output map, and we have, an uh, uh, I call this the state update map, and uh, there's a state retrieval map if you will. And so we just need to specify four maps to specify the behavior of our filter now in the sheet formalism. And we can actually read that off the diagram that we had before. And it's not like we can actually see this here. We don't really need to remember that diagram. But remember, we have this augmented state here. 
and it's basically constructed from a previous state and from an input. So the input injects into that augmented state and the previous state is injected into the augmented state. And this is what the R and I maps achieve, right? This is in a way, if you want to think of it, this is a, a direct product over vector spaces. Uh, the state update map, I, I talked about shifting. You can see that here the index is one, here the index zeros. All these indices have been shifted over by one. So this is this part is just performing a one index shift. And this part here is the summation feedback that we saw with input provided. The output finally is actually basically informed the same thing as up here. It's a weighted sum of our state with a weight on the input. And this is equivalent to the diagram that we, we, we saw in the beginning. Now, these filters in the classical theory are well understood. We know how to make them stable. They basically depend on our choices of coefficients here. But if we define these filters to be stable, we're good. But these computations can do sensible things. Um, to, so this, what we've done now is we've placed the classical computation that we know how to do in a sort of a, a, a classical metric setting. We have placed it over an abstract topological space, right? All we have done with the simplicial complex is gave it a combinatorial definition of that space. So we can put that in any context we want where this makes sense, right? So we can do some embedding and so forth, right? So here's an example of an embedding of a, a line um, complex that actually in this case is closed on itself. So we have a path on the surface of a torus and we've actually chosen uh, these distances of these embeddings to be uniform. But in order to get some sort of interesting changes in distances uh, in our uh, uh, rendering of audio for this example, we actually look at the top projection of the torus. And you can see that the distance here is actually much different than the distance here. So we get perspective for shortening. And we're going to exploit that to actually create an interesting example for us. So let's listen to this example. Uh, this is um, a, a digital filter based sound synthesis algorithm that simulates a plucked string. And the generics uh, algorithm sounds like this. Okay, I hope you could hear that. That's the plug string. I'm going to play it once more. Okay. And now with uh, foreshortening over a torus. Okay. Play this again because it was fun. Okay. Now, what's cool about this is that by the sheaf construction, this is as stable as the classical theory. So I can do anything I want with this. It doesn't just have to be this weird winding over torus. I can noisily perturb it. I can, whatever I want, like by the topological construction, I retain the stability of the original computations. So this is an extremely flexible way to sort of topologize computations locally over a topological space. And if you want to read more about sheaves and topological filters and so forth here, a few sources to that.